What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's special guest is Jake Dolaskel. Jake, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Luke. It's a pleasure to be here, mate. Awesome. Jake, do you want to give my listeners a bit of a, a summary, a bit of a, you know, your journey and your story, like how you came about to do what you do today? Yeah. So look, essentially, Luke, I'm a health coach and I kind of fell into it. I really fell into it, to be honest. So I was working in community development. I was doing like, um, well, like youth work type stuff and, and I was working for a charity. They went out of work. And so at the time I, I was qualified to PT and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go do some PT part-time while I find a new job. Um, and then ironically at the time I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I kind of want to work somewhere where I'm going to learn as well. So I applied for what I thought was the best gym in the country and got accepted and moved into state within about two days. Literally I was given two days notice to go work there. So I did that. And when I was working in this gym, I sort of, this now became like a, a full-time kind of, um, you know, job and, and passion for me. And when I was working there, I discovered that there's a whole lot of people who had maybe body composition goals, but for whatever reason, there was things holding them back. And I'd seen this in kind of my own life as well, not with myself personally, but with loved ones, family members, where they're doing everything perfectly. Advice, like they're following every bit of advice, 100%. They're tracking every single thing they eat. Like everything is just 100% and suddenly nothing changes. You know, they're, they're feeling worse than ever. Body composition's not changing. Energy is awful. Sleep's awful, et cetera. And so that kind of sent me down this rabbit hole. Like I was just kind of getting... I guess, annoyed at not being able to see the changes in, in half of these clients or 30% of these clients. So I went, um, I went pretty deep, probably something like, I guess, similar to a lot of what's driven you, but, you know, I started studying, I got really deep into blood work. That was kind of the first step. Um, and then from there, I kind of found that if I was going to deliver the best results I could to these people who just weren't getting results, I simply needed to tie different things together. So I started studying with you know, various doctors and functional doctors. I started studying under naturopaths. I started studying under bodybuilding coaches. Um, and for me, it was just sort of a matter of, I guess, trying to become like a health problem solver. And so, you know, how could I apply what I've learned from, you know, this area over here with this area over here to actually elicit a result. Um, and I found doing this along the way that probably I'm going to just pick an arbitrary number here, but I'd say a good 25% of the people who, who are coming to me for body composition goals and results, you know, they had these underlying issues that were holding them back. And so it became not just a, um, you know, not just a bonus or, you know, a nice piece of information to have, but it became a necessity. You know, I couldn't do my job as a coach without it. And so that's kind of evolved a little bit. And now majority of my clients are coming to me first and foremost for these health issues. And then second to that, they're coming for body composition goals. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how I got into this space and it sort of evolved over time. Yeah, I find that's a, a common theme amongst a lot of our health practitioners and things. It just stems from curiosity and just wanting to learn mm. more about the body, wanting to learn more about general biology and physiology, which is which is awesome. And you've mm. sort of encapsulated that with what you're doing right now on um, on your Instagram. You're giving a sneak peek and in terms of um, different modalities and, and, and sort of encouraging people that it's, you know, we really need to take a holistic approach, which, yeah. um, which is awesome, man. You're doing a, doing a really great yeah. job with that. So Jake, I, I'd love to, I'd love to dive into, um, let's get stuck into digestive issues because you are perhaps the man when it comes to posting awesome content around, um, digestive function and SIBO, IBS, candida, things like that. So let's, Let's get stuck into that. Let's let's talk about um, digestive issues you see with clients. Yes. So I guess like when clients are coming to me, I'm looking at symptoms first, right? And I think we can get so much information in the symptoms. It's the most, I'd say it's the most valuable data set you can look at beyond any test we can run. And so, you know, I do do some testing with my clients, but first and foremost, if I'm assessing symptoms, the symptoms that people are coming to me with, almost everyone's bloated. Right. Like, you know, and, and people don't even realize this. So what I love is you run a symptom assessment and someone will be like, if you ask him verbally, Hey, what symptoms do you have? The answer might be, uh, none. I think I'm okay. This tends to be more so for men. Men just are not in tune with their own body that well, obviously generalization. But then if I go, okay, so you see you got no symptoms. Do you get bloated? Do you ever like look like you're pregnant? And they'll be like, Oh yeah, every day, but everyone does. I'd be like, okay, you said you had no bowel movement issues. Are you having a bowel movement every single day? And like, oh, nah, twice a week. And there ends up just being this long list of different symptoms. So 
Then for me, I want to investigate, okay, is it most likely this is caused by yeast overgrowth? Is it a bacterial overgrowth? Is it a parasitic overgrowth? And I'm sure we'll go into that a bit deeper, but in all honesty, I find it doesn't matter all that much, right? Because a lot of the time, what we're going to do is going to be very similar, regardless of if it's bacterial, if it's fungal, and we can do things that are going to be, we can intelligently design a protocol, which is going to be effective either way, right? So I've moved away from testing. I never, like, I did use a bit of testing. I still do, but I do it a lot more for people's kind of, um, I guess, peace of mind. You know, if someone's like, hey, I really want to put my finger on on the name, on the diagnosis, that's going to give me that verification that what I'm experiencing is an insanity, then I do it. But otherwise, I, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to look at blood work. I'm going to look at, at, at symptoms and say, look, to me, it looks most likely like this is an acetaldehyde producing organism. I think it's yeast. I think it's fungus. It could be a parasite, but this is what we're going to do. So I guess to answer your question, like what I'm seeing most commonly, it kind of goes in waves. And, you know, with our current environment, with like a, a, this global stress, global anxiety. I don't know what you want to call it, but I feel like that's having a shift in microbiome. Yeah. And so over the last year, I, it just, it's, it's wowed me that I feel like almost everyone coming to me, they've got these symptoms of what I would say is negative gram bacteria overgrowth symptoms. So type of bacteria produces a particular type of endotoxin. I don't know how much you want me to go into this, but basically it's producing something called LPS, lipopolysaccharides. And this is, has a huge systemic effect. It can affect like neurological, it can affect joints, it can affect, um, it can trigger like immune responses. And there's patterns we'll see in blood work. I don't know if we're going to go deep into that, but it just feels like for me at the moment, that is just coming up over and over and over again. That and yeast, I feel like four out of five people I'm seeing, I'm seeing one of those two things come up. Right. Okay. So let's, let's sort of um, take a step back in terms of, those that sort of get stuck with the the general IBS diagnosis, yeah, and they obviously come to you, and they've been told by their doctor about that. Where where would you uh, you do the symptom analysis, and then um, sort of you might sort of lead towards diagnostic testing. Is that right? Yeah, so so my process is um, because blood work is so accessible, I get everyone to do blood work. Okay. Um, and not, you know, nothing special, you know, there's a lot of markers which some labs might not be able to do and whatever. I just start with pretty basic blood work. Um, and in addition with that, I'm going to use symptoms and the combination of those two things <clears throat> to me, nine times out of 10, that's going to give me the data I need. And so, you know, like, like we said about symptoms that can be used diagnostically, right? So if someone's coming to you and they say, look, one of my favorite questions is what foods are causing symptoms? Right. And if someone says, okay, I've got, I've got a sensitivity to onion and garlic and broccoli and, and all these high FODMAP foods. Well, why would FODMAP foods be an issue? Right. Well, FODMAP foods are going to be an issue because they're feeding bacteria. You've done posts on this. I've, I've heard you talk about it. So in a case of something like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this is where FODMAPs are going to be an issue. Could other things have an issue with FODMAPs? Well, I guess sulfur compounds could cause an issue elsewhere. Yeah, there could be possibilities, but by far the most common cause is going to be a bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. Or if someone comes to me and they say, look, I'm actually fine with onion and garlic, but if I eat gluten or if I eat maybe nightshades, like chili um, or I eat dairy, lactose, then I get symptoms. Well, that's a whole different set of foods, right? That's not a FODMAP issue. That's not a bacterial issue. That to me is a permeability issue. Like what's gluten doing? Zonulin protein and gluten, it's its causing permeability. We know this hyperpermeability when you consume it. What's lactose doing? Well, it's broken down by lactase, an enzyme producing the small intestinal lining. So there's damage to the lining. How are we going to go digesting lactose pretty poorly? So just looking at that, and, and I love I love studying your symptoms. Like I just geek out on Lucas because I'll look at these symptoms first or I'll look at blood work. Normally I start with the blood work. And you know, in the case of permeability, what I just sort of touched on there, you're going to normally see immune cell dysregulation. We'll see white cells out. Eventually, they sort of start off high and then they'll kind of go low, the longer it kind of goes. Um, you might see things like globulin elevated. I don't know if your listeners get into blood work, but it's so fascinating if you do. But what you do is you see these patterns and you look at them and be like, that looks like permeability. Let's see what they said. And then you look at symptoms and like, I can't eat chili and I can't eat, you know, yeah. gluten and wheat and, and dairy. So... That's my process. You know, I use the symptoms. I use the blood work. I combine the two, talk to the person, see if there's, you know, we can't overlook like obvious things as well. <laughs> you know, someone might be like, you know, I've had this issue since like, here's another one, you know, you look at symptoms and it's like, well, you've got symptoms of SIBO or, you know, or whatever. And then they say to you, uh, I went overseas to Bali, got sick in Bali. And then 
I've had issues since then. It's like, okay, that's confirmed for me. You've picked, you've either got food poisoning over in Bali and that's one of the biggest causative effects for SIBO or you've picked up a parasite. You know what I mean? Like there's obvious things. We just can't overlook the obvious. Yeah. So that tends to be the process I go down. That's great. I like that. Um, yeah, it's a really strategic and it's just a very pragmatic uh, diagnostic approach, which I think, like you said, nine, time, nine times out of 10, it actually does the job. Mm. Um, so I'd love to... I'd love to dive into um, intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut because, um, yeah, there's a lot of confusion around that topic. So let's sort of look at what are some of the leading causes of, you know, intestinal hyperpermeability? Mm. I mean, when it comes to any sort of digestive issue, there's going to be fairly similar causes for all of them, whether it's bacterial overgrowth or, or yeast overgrowth or permeability. Um, and it's very much a chicken and egg scenario. You know, was there dysbiosis first? Was there an imbalance in bacteria or whatever? And that's led to leaky gut. You know, I've mentioned LPS before. LPS is incredibly damaging, right? LPS is going to damage that gut line. And if we have an excessive amount of LPS, well, that can lead to leaky gut. Or on the flip side, you know, if we've got this, you know, compromised gut environment, compromised, you know, immune response, which is occurring, is that going to have an effect on the microbiome balance? Absolutely. So it's sort of hard to put your finger on, well, this was an issue first, let's address this one first. They're normally going to come in pairs, right? But when it comes to permeability, different types of permeability, again, there's some testing you can do. A lot of testing in this area is not incredibly accurate, and that's also why I steer away from it. And I still do use some of these tests, but you know, the gold standard here would be like a, a mannitol test. You know, it's looking at just things like IgA or zonulin, they don't really cut it. Um, and so, you know, we can look at some of these testings and we can decide, okay, is it more likely permeability? So you've got like intracellular permeability and transcellular permeability. So that it, it's ultimately all leading to the same thing, but is there a sort of, you know, hyper gap between your tight junctions and your gut lining, or is that perhaps not the issue? And maybe the actual lining itself is more permeable to me, it's getting stuck in the weeds, right? This stuff is fascinating. I love listening to people talk about it, but from a, um, I guess the protocol standpoint or, you know, how I'm going to deal with clients, it doesn't really alter that much for me, right? Ultimately, it's going to come down to, well, what are the nutrients we need, whether that's the intestinal crypts between these points or whether that's the actual villi themselves, a lot of these nutrients are pretty similar. So that's sort of the approach I'm going to take. I'm going to say, and a lot of it, you know, I sort of mentioned before, it's, it's health problem solving, right? So we might take an approach where we're doing a period of time where we're just healing the gut line. And that may or may not get someone, it might get someone from here to here and we want to go hundred percent of the way. And so then I might take an approach. Okay. Maybe it was, maybe there's, you know, other aspects of permeability going on, or maybe it was more the, the actual microbiome, which is causing these issues. So it's kind of adaptive. Um, and I think, you know, what people who probably do, you know, whether it's health coaching or, or functional medicine or whatever, eventually I think what a lot of people are going to find is it tends, <laughs> it tends not to be like the one thing that worked. You can't look at someone and be like, for you, it was just this intracellular permeability. And when I used butyrate, that fixed it. What tends to be is there was this cascade of things, and maybe it did start with that, but now there's 20 different things that have all cascaded from one point. And let's kind of throw the kitchen sink at you. And for a period of time, it might actually be we're going to use 10 different interventions. We're going to use half a dozen different supplements. We're going to focus on lifestyle. We're going to get diet dialed in. We're going to do all of this. And that's when it's going to work. It's not just that one thing did it. We kind of need to address all of it. I know that didn't really answer your question, Lucas, yeah. but that's that's great. No, I definitely think it's um, it's just a very logical approach to it. And um, the feedback that you get from clients is, I guess, the most powerful um, tool for you because it's like yeah. you're seeing them over, you know, maybe two three weeks later. There's there's minor improvement. But what happens is a lot of the time with these clients and when, when you work with them is that they actually forget where they were, right? Yeah. So that's Absolutely. like, let's talk about, I guess, um, I sort of want to dive into, uh, I guess, food sensitivities versus intolerances. Now, even myself completing a naturopathy degree, even I am a little bit confused in this realm. Like I try not to get too bogged down with strict definitions or criteria mm. there, but Ultimately, our end goal as practitioners is to get the, the client to a point where they can tolerate as many different food groups, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so a lot of the time, if someone's got a food sensitivity, it wouldn't even be a classic food sensitivity, right? Obviously, when we're talking food sensitivity versus allergy, we're normally talking a different immunoglobulin response, whether it's IgG or IgE. And so 
that's sort of what people are thinking when we're running these tests, we're doing an IgG test or, or whatever it might be. But actually, when someone's coming to you with a food sensitivity, it's normally more what I said before. They're saying, I eat gluten or I eat garlic and suddenly I look pregnant. And that's probably not going to come up on a food sensitivity test. It may or may not, right? So, you know, when it comes to like IgE testing, so food allergy testing, I don't see a lot of value in that. Someone's going to know if they've got a food allergy, right? Um, and, you know, conventionally, people would say, well, that's sort of a lifelong thing. There's not a lot you're going to do about it. I don't know. I haven't seen sort of a whole lot of data on this, but, you know, to give you a quick example, I've got one client at the moment who has um, an egg IgE allergy. Uh, and so every time she eats eggs, any exposure at all, she'll end up in hospital. Like the second last time she ate an egg, it was one of the worst and she's in hospital for a few days. Um, and, you know, we've been doing gut repair and, you know, again, this is just, you know, one case among many and one example, but she messaged me last week and we were only six weeks into it, right? We've done six weeks of, of leaky gut work. Um, and I say that term loosely, I know people like leaky gut, that's pseudoscience. But anyway, we're doing gut lining repair. Um, and she messages me and she goes, I just ate an egg. What do I do? Do I, do I take myself to hospital? I'm like, well, hang on, we're doing a lot of work here. Let's just, let's see what happens. And then I get another message next morning. She's like, nothing happened. I went to sleep. I was fine. Woke up. I'm fine. And so, you know, even, even, you know, it's actual food allergies. Maybe there's some ground we can make on those. Um, now, you know, when it comes to like, you know, more IgG sort of food sensitivities and, you know, I'm sure you, you'd know all about this, but for my issue with these tests and why I don't, you know, if someone's done them, I'll look at them, but I won't order them for people because a lot of the time, majority of the time, when you get this test back, what it's going to tell you is what food you eat, yeah. right? You're going to look at it and be like, oh, I eat chicken every day. I eat eggs every single day. I eat dairy every single day. Look, they're the ones that came up. Yeah, they came up because if there's any degree of permeability, of course, you're going to develop an, 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 an IgG response to that. You know, your body's consistently exposed to those proteins. Of course, that's going to happen. So I don't find that testing overly valuable, at least at this point in time. And I'm always open to changing my, my opinion on that, but I haven't got a lot of valuable data, actionable data out of those. Yeah. So what I find, I guess, more compelling is when someone's identifying a food sensitivity themselves. Right. Because if they do these tests, these people don't even know this, right? Someone, I, I get this all the time and I'll ask a client, Hey, what food sens sensitivities do you have? And I'll get one or two answers. I'll either get the answer of onion and garlic in this makes me feel bad, or I'll get this obscure answer where it's like, I can't eat rocket and I can't eat cos lettuce and I can't, and it's like this weird list. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, you've done one of these tests. So they don't know that those foods make them feel bad. No one ever says to me, rocket makes me feel bad. You know what I mean? So those foods that are stimulating symptoms, they're the ones I'm interested in seeing change. And again, that's going to come down to why are they symptomatic foods? Usually it's going to be because it's a fermentable compound. It's feeding bacteria. So, you know, if we address that overgrowth, we get rid of the, the bacteria that's feeding off these compounds. Is that sensitivity going to go away? Well, of course it is. And there may still be, you know, what I tend to see with my clients anecdotally, Lucas, would be maybe there was 20 foods they couldn't eat. And we've done this, um, I guess I would call it an elimination kind of, not a food elimination, but I mean like an antimicrobial process with the microbiome. And we've, we've tried to get rid of this overgrowth and maybe we've done some repair. And then what we might find is along the way, they can probably start to introduce maybe half of them back in. And then, you know, we do a bit more work. And towards the end, there's probably going to be a couple that they're still not going to do too well with. You know, maybe they're not going to do too well with a banana or if they have too much broccoli in one go. But nine of those 10 foods I had an issue with, they should be able to introduce back in at least to a certain extent. So that tends to be my goal for people to say, look, there's probably going to be one or two foods, just not going to be your best mate, but most foods should be on the table. Yeah, yeah, totally. That makes sense. And yeah, you, you raised some really good points there. Um, one thing that came to my mind in terms of the sensitivity side of things is um, what about the, the situation where they're sensitive to a food group or a particular food, but the symptoms don't show up until 24 hours later, mm. like a delayed response. How do you go about that? Mm. And that tends to be quite... Um... I guess revealing in and of itself. Because if that's happening, again, it's probably not a bacterial issue. Yeah, we're going to know about that pretty quickly, usually, maybe in the large intestine, possibly, but I would doubt it. Um, and so that tends to be more this kind of immune response. Yeah. So to me, if, if I, and, you know, to be honest, a lot of the time, I don't know how necessary it is to completely narrow in and, and zoom in on that specific food. Right. If someone's having, and, a, a, you know, some kind of symptomatic response, that to me is kind of what matters most, 
Yeah. Um, you know, trying to, to identify that exact food that's doing it and eliminating it. Yeah. Someone's going to feel a bit better, but that's not ultimately going to be the turning point for making that protocol work. Yeah. As far as addressing the underlying issue. So, you know, I guess, you know, in that situation and that scenario, what I would do with somebody, they're like, I just have no idea what's bloating me. And, and you get this kind of life, no idea what's bloating me. I'm bloated all the time. Don't know what it is. I'm probably just going to take a chance. I'm going to be like, okay, let's try a low FODMAP diet. Let's see if that does it. Did it help? No. Okay. It, why would a low FODMAP diet not help? But well, probably not bacterial. Maybe it is a little bit more to do with lining. Okay. Maybe we try like an autoimmune paleo diet. Maybe we take out anything that could be triggering an inflammatory response nuts, seeds, legumes, lectins, all these kind of things. Um, depending on how into it a client is willing to go, you know, if someone's like, oh my God, what's the lectin? How do I work that out? Then I might be like, look, don't even worry about it. Here's a, a, the most likely foods that are going to be an issue. Let's try to avoid those and let's just focus on the protocol. And eventually we should see that and start to improve. Mm. Seeing as though we're on the topic of uh, elimination diets and things like that, I thought it'd be worthwhile discussing your stance on the carnivore diet. My stance on carnivore diet. So yeah, let's let's talk, let's talk about it. I um, it's funny. I mean, like I, I do obviously post. Like I'm very sympathetic towards carnivore and towards a, a, an animal based diet, and I post that way on on social media. And so I think like a lot of clients expect me. A lot of people expect me to be a to be full carnivore myself, and b to make all my clients go carnivore. Um, and that's not at all the case. Like I've got you know uh, I can count probably on one hand the amount of clients I've I've. I guess asked or suggested to go carnivore, full carnivore. Um, and you know, myself, I wouldn't necessarily say that I follow a carnivore diet, but I do think that the the foundation of it, and if we were to call it carnivore-ish, I know that's a term Paul Saladino uses, or if we called it an, an animal-based diet, whatever you want to call it, I do think that that is ultimately a foundation that most people would do well following. So that's my personal diet. It's 95% animal products. <laughs> I add in, I add in plant-based foods as yeah, it's same. Yeah. It's they're, they're there for taste, you know? Um, and you know, I'll mention like I was plant-based for 12 years, right? So like I've, I've been there, I've done that. I know how I feel on plants <laughs> and I know what they do to the body, um, and what they don't do. And so, and you know, I'm not saying go out and just eat steak every day necessarily. <laughs> That's probably not a big issue if you do want to do that, but for me, you know, I, I do want to include organ meats. I do want to, I do want to get my micronutrient status up, right? And so that is going to include whether that's, you know, organ meats, whether that's organ supplements, um, whether that's, you know, fatty fish. I'm, I'm making sure my, my meat is grass fed and grass finished. I'm going to town and bone broth, Lucas, man. I'll tell you what I've noticed. I've been like since lockdown. So I'm stuck in lockdown at the moment and I've been having, uh, probably 30 grams of collagen a day in, in bone broth. So I've been having like four or five big cups and I can actually feel my skin is thicker. Like, I know that sounds like crazy anecdote and people can be like, oh, bullshit. But it like legitimately, like, oh, it's just crazy how good that stuff is. So yeah, I mean, I'm definitely think that it's got a lot of legs on it. Whether you need to cut out every single plant <laughs> under the sun, I don't think that's necessary unless you just want to be extra hardcore. Um, but if you're going to, you know, choose between a plant-based and an animal-based diet, hands down, an animal-based diet is going to be far more nutrient dense. People are going to feel infinitely better. The amount of people I talk to clients who are like, I felt like I was dead. I was just a zombie when I wasn't eating meat. And then I included meat back into my, life. I, I like the most common sentence I hear, this is no word of a lie. The most common sentence I hear from people is I felt like I came back to life. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And you know, what's part of that is also with the, um, seeing as though we've, we've sort of discussed, you know, leaky gut, intestinal permeability, a lot of the, the, the micronutrients and vitamins found within these um, organ meats actually strengthen the gut, like vitamin A in liver, things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Vitamin A is a, it's a cornerstone of all my gut permeability programs, uh, you know, protocols. I would use it. I still use it in a supplemental form. I use it in, in cod liver oil because that's, insanely high in vitamin A. But like you said, we don't get that in plants. Yeah. We get a precursor to that, which a lot of people struggle to actually convert. So, you know, if someone does have an overgrowth or they do have permeability, how are they going to go actually repairing some of those, that tissue without some of these cofactors? Incredibly poor. And we see this from a skin perspective. You know, we, we know vegans and I have absolutely nothing against vegans. Like I said, I was plant-based for over a decade, but we know that in a vegan diet, they're going to be deficient in things like particular amino acids, say, let's say glycine, um, and some of these cofactors we need for collagen production. So you see it in the skin, like a lot of people, they age pretty poorly when they do cut out animal products. Now, skin is not that different to your intestines. Your intestinal lining is made out of collagen. 
And so how do you think you're going to go repairing collagen tissue yeah. if you're lacking those cofactors? Yeah, yeah, no, nah, spot on, spot on. Well, then in terms of, um, let's say you're sort of doing similar to me, a modified, modified carnivore diet, yeah. which plant foods do you like to include that are like mm. least toxic in your eyes? Yeah. So personally, I include berries. I include blueberries and raspberries. I, I kind of just really like to taste raspberries, to be honest. Um, but I don't mind getting a little bit of extra vitamin C. I know there's a bit of a debate. Do you need vitamin C? Blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't, I, I do still get carbs in my diet to try to fuel training. And so my vitamin C need, I would imagine, will be a little bit higher due to that. So I do add in berries. I add in um, rocket and, and ginger or like bitter foods that help with, with bile secretions. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I add in herbs. I think as much herbs as we can add in, the better. Coconut. I mean, that's usually kind of accepted on a, co- on a carnivore diet sometimes anyway. Um, and sometimes pomegranate, which is not super easy to find. Uh, and citrus. I normally add in some lime or lemon juice. Um, and my guilty pleasure is I do sometimes have, <laughs> I do sometimes have like orange juice, um, just an easy carb to get in. A guilty, a guilty pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there, honestly, that's, that's 90, 99% of the plants that I'm eating. And then if I go out, which I don't do much because I'm in lockdown. Um, but if I were to, you know, get, go out for dinner, then obviously I'm going to eat something outside of that scope. But for my day to day kind of diet, that's what I'm consuming. Yeah. Nice. Sounds, uh, Sounds surprisingly similar to mine. <laughs> so the thing that I, when, when Paul Saladino, and I really love his work, I really respect what he does, but in terms of discrediting some of, some of the anti-inflammatory and the anti-cancer properties of some of the polyphenols, like mm. let's look at pomegranate, for example. I know you're a fan mm. of pomegranate. From a gut health perspective, like what is that offering people? Just Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually why I use it more so, more from a gut health perspective. So obviously the polyphenol argument, you know, that's, there's, I don't know, a few different sides to that, even antioxidants, you know, I don't know that antioxidants sort of do what we thought they did. Um, and so I'm happy to kind of be, I'm happy to not have a firm opinion on those things at this point. Um, but with pomegranate, what do we know about pomegranate? We know that, and you know, there's a difference between different parts of the plant. I know that. And often I use it with clients and actually use um, the actual hull and, and I'll get them to use it in a tincture, but pomegranate, A, it, it actually is a selective antimicrobial. And so it's quite good against pathogenic and opportunistic organisms, including yeast, including parasites, including opportunistic bacteria, but it doesn't deplete good bacteria. It doesn't seem to have an effect on lactobacillus and bifidobacterium and some of the stuff we do want in the gut. So I love it from that perspective. There's some evidence, and again, I'm, I don't know how compelled I am about by it, but some evidence that suggests it has, and you'll know much more about this, positive effects on testosterone. Is that stuff you, yeah, you come across yeah. that as well? There's um, a little bit of research in terms of shifting the cortisol to testosterone ratio, helping with that. Uh-huh. And then also you're getting the, um, all the endothelial, the nitric oxide benefits. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why people use it like pre-workout. Again, yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a couple of studies that are showing you a little bit of benefit if you had enough pre-workout, but you know, I don't think people are normally consuming enough to have that kind of effect. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, like with, if, if let's say we did go on a really strict carnivore diet, then obviously there are a lot of nutri, uh, you know, taurine, we're getting glycine and things like that. But what about the things that support like nitric oxide production, endothelial mm. function. I feel like we miss out. We don't get them mm. in mm. animal-based foods, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, and, and um, you know, we're in an advantageous position because we can also supplement. Like I know that there's a lot of things that you would be supplementing with to enhance performance and the stuff that I would supplement with. And so, you know, supplements are just that. Obviously, they're, they're supplemental on top of a diet. And I think ultimately any any very extreme diet is going to rely heavily or at least in some degree on supplements, whether that was a plant-based or whether that's a purely animal-based diet. The, the only difference is why you're relying on that. Yeah, I think in, in an animal-based diet, we're relying more on, on supplements, probably more from like a performance standpoint. You know, your performance is just going to tank yeah. if you're not really, you're not consuming any carbs, any starches, anything else. Like I said, nitric oxide, precursors, et cetera. Um, and then plant-based, it's more going to be, well, performance is probably going to be a little bit better, but, you know, ability to build muscle and and ability to, you know, hit your micronutrient needs and and support various other functions within the body. Well, that's going to be suffering. So it just depends. Um, Something that came up when we were talking about uh, pomegranate, my my YouTube coach has been recently telling me what sort of topics to talk about on YouTube. And he he tells me off because some of the things that I find are way too niche. They're just way too like, 
And there was one study that showed that um, pomegranate lowers, uh, sorry, is it, yeah, decreases melatonin production. And I was like, oh, so that's probably, you know, one sort of food group you'd want to avoid in the evening. So that's interesting something to throw out to the listeners if they're listening in. That's interesting. That's when I tend to have my pomegranate. So, and sometimes I'll get like an organic pomegranate juice, mix that with mineral water, have that at, at night and evening. I haven't noticed an effect on sleep, but I'll look out for it a bit more now. Yeah. Cool. So let's, um, we, we also touched on some of our um, favorite supplements. Let's sort of talk about one that we both love and that's Tutka. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it too much. It's all going to go out of stock. I won't be able to teach with clients. I find this happens all the time. Um, um, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I don't know how much you've gone into it in your podcast so far, but it's a staple I use with, I'd say, I'd say 50% of my clients are using it, right? So how many people have bile issues? It's just insane the amount of people. When I get blood work back, the most common panel I'm going to see issues in is going to be the liver panel. And whether that's elevated liver enzymes, which usually I'm going to see, I suspect more as results of like let's, yeast. Let's look at that. What is yep. elevated in your eyes? Like what? Yeah. Like numbers. Yeah. Let's look at that. Yep. So if we're talking, so if we're talking like specifically the liver, I'm mainly going to be looking at ALT and ASD. Um, I generally work with females, right? So I'm working off about 10 to 25 with ASD and ALT. For males, I'm happy to see it a little bit higher than that, maybe 28 or 29. I still want to see it below 30. Um, and there's, there's particular markers, which for me, even though I've got this uh, functional sort of range or window that I'm looking at, if I see it, there's some markers, and this confuses some of my mentoring clients, right? Because there's some markers where as long as it's in that window, I don't care. It can be like right at the end. You know, I guess an example might be like, um, what would be an example? Oh, you know, maybe a white blood cells, okay? So neutrophils or whatever. If they're on the lowest end of my optimal 3.0, I don't care. That's fine. But if I look at something like a live enzyme mark or Billy Rubin, and it's on, it's still within what I would say is optimal, but it's, it's one point off. I'm, I'm not saying that's an issue, but I want to look at everything else. And if other things are also one point off the upper end, in like, you know, to go back to AST and LT, if these are both, if you're male and your AST and your LT is sitting at 28 for both of these, maybe not an issue, but now let's look at triglycerides. Oh, let's look at GGT. Or oh, let's look at Billy Rubin or ALP. And if there's any kind of inconsistency in these other markers, to me, that's enough to say that AC and ALT sitting at 27, even though that's relatively low, still probably an issue for you, yeah. right? Um, so that's one of the most common things I'm seeing, elevation, AC and ALT. I see that commonly with yeast. And I say that not so much because I'm testing for yeast. It's not super easy to test for yeast in all honesty, but symptoms, yeast symptoms are pretty bloody clear cut. So if I'm seeing an elevation AST and LT and I'm seeing yeast symptoms, what's the most likely scenario to me? <laughs> most likely it's yeast. If I'm seeing no yeast symptoms and I'm seeing ALT and AC elevated and this person's got a history of using anabolics or they're you know, potentially you know, metabolic issues or overweight or whatever, okay, it's probably not a yeast issue. It's probably that one. So you kind of need to use a bit of, I guess, intuition there, but um, Tucker. So I use it when I see elevation in, in liver enzymes um, and bilirubin being elevated for me, I work off about five to 15 in um, standard international units. And if we're seeing bilirubin elevated, that to me is one of the best markers to use small intestinal dysbiosis because we know that there's the tense, well, A, we know that we need good bacteria for regulation of bile. Yeah. B, we know that that bile itself is antimicrobial in the small intestine. So if someone's got this issue with bile secretion and, and bile release, it stands for reason there's, there's likely to be this, this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or issue there. And that's something you see with people who have SIBO and then relapse. A lot of the time, why would someone relapse? Yeah, okay, there could be lifestyle factors that didn't change, but one of the most common causes for relapsing is this still a bile issue. And they're not able to actually keep a lid on that bacterial overgrowth. So that's what I'm using. You say Tudka, I say Tudka. I don't know. It, I probably just got it off how I read it. Um, but that's one of the reasons I'm using that as well, or to prevent relapsing, not just to, to support liver enzymes and, and repair liver tissue, which obviously it's amazing for. And, you know, there's so many benefits to it. There's evidence that suggests it, it supports immunity, even might have an effect on the gut lining. So a whole long list of benefits. But for me, I'm using it largely to actually prevent relapsing. Wow. Amazing. And let's look at some, well, what else is causing some of the um, uh, bile uh, issues with uh, bile release or bile production? Like what are some factors that might affect that? Yeah, look, there could be a few things. So again, if I was to go look at bloods and try to work out what's going on here, if we see an elevation in, in bilirubin, 
And then we see, for example, alkaline phosphatase, ALP, if that's elevated as well, that's giving me a different pattern. To me, an elevate, and I'm saying elevation would be anything above about 100, okay? If I'm seeing that pattern, high ALP, high bilirubin, maybe even high GGT, or let's say GGT, I don't want to confuse people here, but if GGT was, was higher than ALT and ASC was, that pattern to me, that's pretty common with things like a biliary duct obstruction or something, some actual issue within the biliary tree itself, right? So in that issue, I'm thinking, okay, could there be like gallstones? You know, do we just need to do something here to actually support bile flow and, and your gallbladder, right? To me, that's probably more the issue rather than a, a SIBO or a yeast or something like that, yeah? If ALP is looking fine, GGT, maybe a bit elevated, maybe low, more commonly I'm going to say low in this instance, and ALT and ASD are the ones that are elevated. Well, to me, that's suggesting it's more, whether that's a small intestinal bacterial or small intestinal fungal, but it's saying that the issue there with bile is probably more because of what's going on from a microbiome perspective, right? And then obviously there can be issues with cofactors. You know, what if we have taurine issues? You know, what if someone's, again, plant-based, not getting any taurine or much taurine in the diet? Well, you know, that could be an issue there as well. So, and that's harder to pick up in bloods, right? If someone's actually missing some of the cofactors for, for bile, that's pretty hard to, to kind of know. Um, and then there's other clues we can get as well. If we look at other lipid markers, let's look at cholesterol. Let's look at even, I like looking at fat soluble vitamins. Like if we look at vitamin D, and I never want to over extrapolate with vitamin D because there's so many factors that, it, that affect it. You know, is someone getting enough sun? Did they have an infection? Whatever. But if we look at fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D or vitamin A and they're low and someone's cholesterol is high or low, triglycerides high or low, they've clearly got this issue here with breaking down, utilizing fats, storing fats. There's, there's going to be some bile issue there. Yeah. Good point. That's a really intelligent way to look at it. And I guess, um, yeah, in terms of the bitter aspect of it as well, we're sort of getting that um, sort of stimulation of stomach acid, which I really want to mm. I really want to dive deeper into. Um, you know, this issue with low stomach acid. Explain mm. to my listeners some of the consequences of having um, low stomach acid. A lot of the time, that's going to be the the. I guess, starting point for dysfunction, right? And there's so many things that affect stomach acid and, you know, again, nutrient deficiencies that can affect zinc. We need zinc. What's going to deplete zinc? Well, again, plant-based diet, not going to get a lot of zinc. Birth control pill, going to deplete zinc. You know, if, even if someone's got genetic issues, you know, methylation issues tend to be low zinc. So there's a lot of things that can lead to low zinc. And if we have low zinc, or ions, another example, we need this to actually produce stomach acid, but then we need the stomach acid to actually absorb these nutrients, it just becomes a cycle. So now if someone's got low and, you know, other factors could be stress, could be age, um, you know, just being in a sympathetic state, that's going to decrease stomach acid production, eating like on the go when you're working. So there's a lot of things that can affect it. And how many people are using medication that, that block stomach acid, PPIs or antacids? If I could eliminate one thing, it'd be PPIs. Like this stuff, it just causes infinitely more issues than it could possibly ever solve. <laughs> from a you know, chemist family, you know this anyway. Well, did you, um, did, you ever have, did you ever have to go on it when you were younger? No, I didn't, luckily. Well, here's a three-year streak there. <laughs> <laughs> Champion PPI user right here. <laughs> and that's it. People use it for years, absolutely years. PPIs and, and um, antihistamines. I get clients who've been using this stuff for decades yeah. and they just think it's normal. Anyway, we're going on a tangent here. So stomach acid, with there's so many things which are competing with us for, for adequate stomach acid production. And so if we've got low stomach acid, what do we need stomach acid for? Apart from just breaking down foods, we need it for you know B12, zinc, iron, et cetera, protein, amino acids, but it's also sterilizing, right? Like, you know, we, we consume something that's maybe got bacteria on it or got parasites or whatever. And part of the job of the stomach acid is actually to kill that stuff off and actually help neutralize and sterilize before it enters our gut. So some evidence has suggested that could actually predispose us to things like a bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. So that's one issue, right? In addition to that, the, the, the acidity, the pH of the stuff that's leaving our stomach, entering into our small intestine, that's what's going to trigger the release of other digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, even bile. And so if what's leaving our stomach isn't acidic enough, now that's going to affect fat digestion as well and carb digestion and, and absorption. And, and even just the way that like motility in our intestines, right? Like the stuff is going to sit for longer. It's going to putrefy. It's going to ferment. So it tends to be, and then we know what else can we experience with that? Well, if we're getting this sort of, you know, impaired motility and impaired sort of um, 
you know, I guess just movement throughout the intestinal um, tract, then we're going to be more prone to things like constipation or even diarrhea or even this sort of undulating between the two. And so a lot of the time, low stomach acid is very top of that kind of tree. And we, we address that and whether the other stuff completely fixes or whether it improves, usually it's going to improve, right? Like by the time there's all this other stuff going on, they've probably got a bacterial overgrowth and they've probably got, you know, X, Y, Z. But unless we kind of fix the stomach acid issues, most of that stuff's really not going to get that much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can, it can be a root cause for a lot of people, right? Having just yeah. low stomach acid. Yeah. And even some of these, um, some of these bitter herbs like, um, let's say, gentian root or ginger, um, they also, you know, stimulate the stomach acid, and then also happen to help with pancreatic ex, uh, exocrine yeah. function and things like that, which is which is awesome. So I want to. Um, you summarize that really, really well. I want to sort of switch gears and sort of delve into yeah, body composition a little bit on yeah. body. you sort of, we were talking off camera, uh, off, off, offline about um, this awesome study you found in terms of switching up the caloric intake. Yeah. And no, uh, I didn't know we were going to talk about it. So I didn't go and look it up. And, and, you know, if I, um, if I butcher a couple of the details, I do apologize here. And it was only one study and my, to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been replicated. And I would love to see it replicated. And I know Bill Campbell does a lot of really good studies on, um, he's even doing a little bit of stuff now on like every other day fasting and, and things. So it'll be quite interesting to see that. Um, but ultimately this study I saw was done in, in overweight men. Okay. So that's the first thing, just to keep that in mind. I will say I've used this method with a lot of females and I find it to be very effective. So I don't think that that makes a big impact, but I just wanted to mention that. And what they did with these overweight men is I put them on a heavily, heavily, heavily restricted diet for four days. I believe it was four days. And ultimately they, they basically just had like protein shakes, right? Like next to nothing, 60 grams of protein or something like that. And, and I don't do it quite that extreme with my clients, but you know, it's a pretty good um, foundation. And then what they did is they got them to do very low intensity exercise. They got them to walk and they did like stacks of walking. They did something like eight hours of walking on these days. Yeah. For four days. Sounds so like four days. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like they're just on, on Lucas's like standing <laughs> treadmill desk. That's it. That's all they did. And, and for four days they did this. And then this is the most amazing bit. At the end of four days, they went back to just normal, went back to the normal diet, normal lifestyle. Okay. And and this is a bit, I don't remember the exact detail, but it was something like on average, I lost four or five kilos over that time. Okay. And then a year later, they went back and they saw that, that something like 95% of the weight that they'd lost had been maintained. And so there was, yeah, there was, so it was actually, as far as studies go, it was the most effective diet we've got because the rebound effect in diets is insane. Usually it's the 95% rebound, right? Exactly, exactly. And so the fact that they maintain almost all the fat loss, so what that's saying is there was no adaptation that occurred, right? In four days, in obese individuals, four days of low calorie, high energy output, there wasn't this metabolic adaptation. They went back to baseline. They were fine to be able to eat that without, you know, overspill affecting. Um, now, I don't do it quite that extreme. Could someone do that? Absolutely. Seems like it works amazing. But what I tend to do with clients, and Luke, I'm giving you like my, my golden nugget here. Like this is something, you know, I hold close to heart. But, um, you know, with clients who especially quick to adapt, right? So say you've got a client who, uh, you know, has a history of yo-yo dieting, okay? And they've, you know, lost a lot of weight in the past, have regained. A lot of the time, the baseline is going to be lower anyway. And, and I, this is me speaking anecdotally here, but these people tend to adapt very quickly. You put them in a deficit, they lose a week and then nothing. Drop them again, they lose a week and then nothing. And they're just like super, super quick adapters. So with those types of clients, I love using a method like this. And, and I'll adapt it a little bit. And I might do, say, two days. I might do two days a fortnight. And those two days, I just say, look, we're not going to work out in these days. These are not going to be high stress days. Don't do this when you're working. But you normally do what people spend an hour at the gym. They spend 15 minutes warming up. It might take them 15 minutes to get to the gym, 15 minutes to get home and have a shower for 15 minutes after that's a two hour block of their day that they're spending training. I say, look, that two hour block of your day, let's do, let's use that two hour block, but you're just going to walk, right? You, if you're hitting 10,000 steps a day normally, and you add in another two hours of walking, you're going to hit 25,000 steps almost that day, right? Let's do that for two days as well as, and, you know, I won't say you needed to hit 500 calories, but I'll say, look, let's keep it as low as we can. And I don't want to give you disordered eating, but I say, what, if you're capable of, of hitting a thousand, let's hit a thousand. If you can do lower, do lower. 
I don't really mind. I just want you to make the biggest deficit you can on those two days. Yeah. And let's still hit some protein. Um, and if we do that, say someone's, you know, at baseline might be 2000 calories and they've now been able to hit a thousand or 800 for those two days, they've now, you know, um, been in a, what, a 22, 20, what, 2400 calorie deficit just from diet over those two days. If we add in the walking, there's another maybe thousand calorie deficit or so from that, that's enough to lose what half a kilo just in two days. Yeah. Go back to baseline. You do that again the next fortnight. Okay. It's a little bit slow, but for someone who couldn't lose anything to now lose maybe a kilo in a couple of weeks, a few weeks, that's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of doing something like that. It makes sense. And then think about the day, the next day, how much more insulin sensitive they've become because yeah. of their body a, a break. And yeah. whilst they're doing that low intensity cardio in a very low caloric environment, their fat burning state is highly activated. Like part of the, um, if you heard of like the fat burner, your bean, they always say mm. your bean first thing in the morning fasted because that's when insulin's low. So I guess mm. even to expert, I'm just thinking about a protocol now. I'm thinking about what sort of yep. fat burners we can incorporate. On yeah. This. Yeah, which is it's awesome. Yeah, man, that'll take us to the next level. After we'll have to keep talking about that. <laughs> so I'm like a uh, a little like protocol there, like some yeah. sort of awesome um, cyclical fat loss protocol, which is awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So, and then sort of um, you sort of touched on fasting a little bit. I, I, I want to hear your stance here, like uh, your personal stance. Don't worry about it's not so much with clients, but your stance on it just for yourself. Um, so it does depend a little bit on my, um, I guess my goal at that point in time. So generally speaking, I am, I am doing some form of, of intermittent fast or modified fast. Um, usually for me, that'll look similar to a 16, eight and I'm not sort of dogmatic about it. Um, and i you know, actually I should, I'm even using the word fasting quite loosely because a lot of the time my fasting might actually just involve me having bone broth for the first half of the day. And so that's probably most common for me. I normally um, might just, I might have a couple of hours in the morning, but I don't have anything. And then I might have bone broth up until midday and then I'll start eating for midday or one o'clock or whatever. Um, that tends to be what I'm doing most of the time. If I was to switch gears and go into purely just hypertrophy mode, I want to gain as much muscle as I can. I'd probably swap that out a little bit. I might do that a couple of days a week. Um, I would still maintain it to some extent and, and, you know, certainly have in the past, but, you know, obviously if there's going to be high caloric intake, I'm probably going to spread that over a little bit more time. Um, but I just, I, I feel like I function pretty well fasting. Um, you know, I do a lot of calls and I do, you know, a lot of work on my computer and I find that, I don't, not that I feel bad if I'm eating, but I, it's something I don't need to think about if I'm fasting. Um, and I might just get that little edge and clarity. Um, so yeah, I do like doing it. Yeah, that's cool. I wonder if there's, um, I'm curious to know if there's any sort of link between how fasting affects ooh, intestinal permeability. Is there any sort of research there helping? Yeah, look, there is. And I think um, people like Dr. Zach Bush have talked about that a bit. Um, I couldn't sort of quote anything meaningful at you, but um, even, I don't know if you've looked, Lucas, into data behind like going out into nature and actually, um, like in a fasted state in nature for like three to five days, like what effect that can have on, on, on microbiome and, and gut lining. Um, really interesting stuff. I'd encourage people to check out Dr. Zach Bush, but yeah, yeah it's not, not something I sort of like, it's a lot of these extreme measures. I don't, apart from what I just talked to you about, I tend not to use a lot of those with clients because, you know, people sort of, there's not, you know, not many people are going to go out into nature for four days and fast, right? So, you know, I need to find stuff that people are willing to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, was there any, any sort of other areas, any sort of, um, any topics, areas you want to, you're excited to see more research in any sort of fields you're really you know passionate about at the moment? It's a good question. Um, again, most of the clients I work with are females, right? So, um, and not that that sort of changes a whole lot, like the digestive issues that guys and girls deal with are going to be pretty similar. But I guess what I find really interesting at the moment is um, how a lot of, you know, females tend, I say this loosely, tend to deal with more hormonal issues than guys do. Obviously, you know, better than I do that <laughs> testosterone is a huge hormonal issue all guys are dealing with. But 
Um, you know, when it comes to things like endometriosis, like I'm really, I guess, fascinated by some of the stuff coming out around that. Um, for you know anyone who doesn't know, it's it's a I guess a pain condition that generally females deal with. Some there's actually some documented cases of men, but it's usually females. Um, and essentially, it's it's characterized mostly by extremely painful periods. Um, can be pain around like other times of the cycle as well, exercise, bowel movements, etc. Now, I guess why I find that so interesting is while it's really so generally people will say there's there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, conventionally, mm, you've got that for life. Can't do anything. It's going to get worse. Or if you're lucky, you can do a surgery. That might help, but it's probably going to get worse again after that. Um, and so the the medication of choice tends to just be the birth control pill. Let's shut off hormones. Let's try to manage it that way. Um, and you know, nothing against that. If that's going to if that's a step someone's going to take in their journey, that's okay. Um, but it's certainly not going to fix any issues, right? Um, now, what I find so interesting in this is there's there's little little interesting bits of research come out along the way. And so what we did have a few years ago is this research that came out that showed that people with endometriosis actually had higher levels of LPS, that toxin I talked about before, lipopolysaccharides, in the menstrual blood. That's pretty interesting. Why do people with endo have more LPS? Why do, LPS is, is produced by negative gram bacteria. Why do people with endo have more negative gram bacteria? We need to start thinking about that. Yeah. And then we see other research come out showing that people with endometriosis have higher correlations to SIBO. Yep. Okay. Interesting. SIBO often is made up of negative gram bacteria. You know, why, why would that be the case? Um, and now we've seen like papers coming out showing that people with endo have higher, I don't know if you saw this one, have higher um, correlation or higher um, uh, likelihood of having a sensitivity to nickel. Have you seen that? Nickel? To nickel. Really? And Yeah like exponentially the higher the copper iud it's not in any of the no 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 but it is in food and the way that they die the way that you would you would diagnose this at home diagnose it use that loosely but the way you would you know ascertain this is you if you're using cheap jewelry earrings necklaces whatever and you get like a a skin flare that's a sign you've probably got a nickel sensitivity right and so what the hypothesis was here is that this ongoing low grade response to nickel in foods? Because we get nickel anytime we're exposed to, to steel, essentially. Most steel is going to have nickel mixed in with it. Yeah. So you're cooking on a stainless steel fry pan, you're going to ultimately there's going to be nickel in that. You have a coffee out of a steel coffee machine, there's going to be nickel. Some foods contain nickel, cans, whatever. So um, the hypothesis is that this constant exposure to this low grade inflammation in some women could lead ultimately to like a, a a permeability state, right? And that immune dysregulation could potentially be a trigger or in some ways implicated with endometriosis. Wow. So that stuff I'm finding really interesting. And I've had clients who, who, you know, I had this one client who she was taking a, she she would say to me, it was a, a, a box, a whole box of painkillers. I don't know how many was in a box. I don't take painkillers. I don't know. You'd know better than I do. I don't know what that is. Um, but it sounded like a lot. <laughs> and, and she goes, oh, I'd need a whole box every single period, no questions asked. I buy a new box every single period. Um, and then by addressing some of these things within a couple of cycles, she's now using two painkillers, right? And yeah, like that's it. And she's like, I didn't even, she's like, I didn't even know my period was coming. Like I didn't even have pain. And so, you know, whether we can get someone to a point where they're hundred percent improvement or whether it's 80% improvement, you know, it, it depends on the individual, but that kind of stuff I'm finding fascinating where someone has been told their whole life, there's nothing you can do about this. This is like, you've inherited this. This is just a genetic issue. Nothing can be done. But then we're seeing very clear ties to the gut lining and to the microbiome. And when we address those things, we're seeing improvements. That's the stuff I'm fascinated in. Yeah, that's that's incredible, man. Just to hear the sort of links there, like, you know, stemming all the way back, looking at some of the underlying causes. Mm. Um, Because there is a huge correlation between those that have endo and bizarre gut issues, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in those studies, I don't want to like go into too long about this, but what they find is someone who, who identified as having SIBO and endometriosis, you address the SIBO, you do a low form of diet and actually the endo symptoms got better. Crazy. Like why did that happen? Yeah. I actually just finished interviewing um, Dr. Miranda Miles and she spoke about this directly. And she also mentioned the elevated um, beta glucuronidase. Yes. I mean, yeah, obviously. Yeah. And that that sort of links in there, but we could we could go on and on about we could we're gonna have to do a second episode because I know my listeners are gonna absolutely love this episode. So Jake, 
Where can um where can my listeners connect with you? Where can they learn more about your services? So currently all my stuff is on Instagram. I am trying to diverse, um, but at the moment they search up coach underscore Jake Dollar Shell. So that's D-O-L-E-S-C-H-A-L, which is not easy for finding me. Um, but that's where all my content is at the moment. I am trying to diversify because there's good things like censorship which are happening um and so i will have i say that obviously tongue in cheek not good at all but i will have a website up and live in a couple of months time um awesome. but at the moment that's where i am brilliant brilliant so i'll make sure to link those in the show notes but uh jake thanks for coming on the show man absolutely pleasure mate thank you so much for having me awesome